So I'm going to be talking mainly about uh, documentary editing, but mostly uh, it won't be talking, it will be show and tell. So I will be showing a lot of clips and then uh, saying why I did this and why I did that in different situations in documentaries. And quite often, uh, I'll, I'll show some things in fiction as well, because I want, really want to emphasize that the boundary between documentary and fiction nowadays uh, like are very thin. So um, I come from fiction. I come from having edited Eric Romer's films for 30 years, and then all of a sudden I got dropped into the, the documentary pool. Um, and when I, was, um, when I started to do documentary editing, it wasn't because I was an expert in documentary editing, it was simply because someone was looking for an editor who speaks Chinese in, in Paris. So, um, so it turns out that the technique that I use in storytelling in fiction then helped a lot in structuring the stories um, in documentary. And of course, the funny thing now is that uh, I'm, I'm asked a lot to do complicated uh, documentaries with a lot of footage um, with references to uh, works like Last Train Home. I think before that, I actually was already interested in documentaries. But for a long time, the documentary world and the fiction world were very separate, at least in, in France, in terms of that it's almost like um, the, the, the there's some sort of <laughs> this, it's like some sort of uh, mistrust between the two worlds. It's like uh, they, they, they would never imagine hiring me to do, to edit a documentary because they was a you know, fiction editor, you know, they don't know how to do, edit a documentary. And, and the other way around as well, you know, there are some, some who do, who only edit uh, fiction films and just, you know, like you know, documentaries television, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, but as I said, you know, like uh, now more and more, there's, there's more and more mixing. And I'd like to emphasize the fact that this is like a discussion. So I just want to show you things that I've been doing. Um, and I, I think I would really welcome everybody to just ask questions while we go, while we get along. And when I said that I come from fiction, it's not entirely true because uh, I grew up in, in Canada and I went to Concordia, which uh, when we were doing, it wasn't even film studies, it was communication arts. And we were actually, we started by studying um, experimental films like uh, Maya Duran and, and Stan Brakhage and so on. And so a lot of the a lot of the solutions that I, I'm looking for that I, f I find when I'm editing in a documentary at the first instinctively comes from experimental films, um, which may be a little bit odd. So it is actually uh, a good thing that I was not trained in traditional documentary. Uh, film film structures. So when people talk to me about, like you know, uh, even recently, especially in big institutions, when they talk to me about three act structures, um, I come sometimes it's very be bewildering because, uh, in fact, in fact, the f the fact that I didn't come from a film school, that I came from communication arts. Even in fiction, I don't know what a three-act structure is supposed to mean. Um, so, and and uh, I think just thinking about that, just thinking about you know, somebody throws it 
out like that three act structure. You know, in the first act I do this, in the second act I do this, in the third act I do this. It's already um, something really scary. You know, how, how, why do you put yourself in a box? You know, why don't you see how, the, how it flows? You know, how, what the story needs, how it needs to be told um, before you put yourself in a box? Um, I think in a way, in that way, perhaps I was influenced by my master, <laughs> Eric Romer, who didn't believe in film schools. <laughs> he just thought that you would all be just much more formatted uh, coming out of any kind of structured programs like that than if you just go out and, and, and look at films and, and make films, which in a way, um, of course, I agree with him, but um, maybe uh, today, maybe we need some, some technique. Um, so when, we, when I, I maybe come back to him first, because one of the first things that I try to do when I'm editing a story, and documentaries are always stories, um, I, is that I still remember what I learned from him, which is the first thing is being clear is to be uh, clarity, to not, you know, quite often, like even today when we were doing workshop, part of the workshop today was like, how do we make this whole big thing into something that's a clear, uh, something that's clear for the audience? Um, maybe not necessarily um, a, I don't mean that there has to be a linear storyline, but uh, it, it, but you shouldn't be going all over the place. You know, it's, it it shouldn't be confusing. It should be tried to be clear. And the other, the second thing that I uh, try to go by is try to. I would sort of edit a scene or I have a first cut of a scene by somebody, by, by my assistant or somebody who's been doing the, you know, the assembly or something. And quite often I would um, uh, then redo the, of course, redo the, the scene and, and maybe redo it again and redo it again to try to find a way to tell the story, tell the scene, by making it less flat. Um, and that is often by, again, <laughs> throwing out what, uh, whatever they told us in film school in terms of, you know, like a starting with a, a, a establishing shot and then you go into a whatever and then you go into a close up and then you show the object that the person is picking up and, and stuff like that. And, um, so, you know, once that is, you know, if somebody has set up the scene like that, I try to find another way to do it and, and so that it could be, it could be surprising as a, to, to surprise the audience. But at the end, to always give them the, something that is clear. Um, and I think that the last thing that then I would uh, arrive at is having a rhythm that is um, something that is more flowing. Uh, when I say flowing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't use jump cuts, but even jump cuts can be very, can be something that is harmonious and that uh, is, oh, I, I mean, I like to think about it in the French as being elegant, but it's elegant has a connotation of, you know, like a, something snobbish, but it's not. It's just a, a sort of a flowing sort of a, a rhythm. So, um, let me start by um, some sort of my favorite tricks or favorite techniques or something like that. Uh, one of them, I'm, I'm one of those people who I always say to my directors that uh, I have to find the beginning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, talk about the, there are 
different methods for different editors. And the way that I do things is that I'd like to discuss the project uh, in documentaries, especially. I would discuss the project with the director. Uh, they, they would um, tell me what they want, tell me their, their what they think is the story and what they, what they want to tell. Uh, and maybe um, an assembly by somebody. And um, then I would, and they would give me a selection of, uh, of what, they, what they like or what they have selected. But I would ask to have all the rushes available. Um, and then, <laughs> then I would ask them to leave me alone for a few months. And then, uh, then, then I would come back with a cut, and, and, and then we start discussing again, and then we start to really work together. But it, uh, to have that first cut, um, the, the, the assembly, the, the selection that, that I asked for, it's actually something that is uh, it's not necessarily something that I would uh, use to 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 guide me, but it's a very interesting and important tool for me, for me, because the directors would have selected what he thinks or she thinks is important, uh, and by that sometimes I just go into the rushes and look at what's behind it, what's what's in front, you know, what's near the the place that they selected for the simple reason that uh, sometimes I'm looking for what the director did not select. Because there are a lot of, um, I find that for some strange reason, directors are quite often censoring themselves. And that what they think is not interesting, uh, it's always for, sometimes for the wrong reasons. Because they're thinking, uh, especially, I hear this all the time in documentaries, but that shot is out of focus, or that shot is not in focus enough, you know, but it really doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, and if it's strong and emotional and uh, it's uh, full of the whatever that I need, um, you know, if it goes out of focus for a split second, it really doesn't matter. Um, and, and, uh, and sometimes they would censor themselves for for other reasons. So I always ask for the rushes to be there, but then then I would go with the selection, and then I would go into the rushes to see what is around that selection. So it's like spying. It's like a sort of a detective work. Um, so for me, I always need to then find a beginning. I need to find a beginning before I can before the rest of the film would come into place. And sometimes it's very scary for the production because sometimes it would take me weeks before I can find the beginning for, a, a, I'm talking about documentaries, for a documentary storytelling. Uh, and during that time, they don't know what, you know what the hell I've been doing you know, at home with all the rushes. Um, it's, uh, it's a very mysterious process, but sometimes it would just come like that. It would just, uh, it would just uh, happen. And so to help me, I have one trick. Uh, one of the things that I find that helps me a lot is to find a prologue. Joy. Uh, it's, 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 practically helped me every time, and that's with, when I find my prologue, I find my film. Um, and this prologue, sometimes it has nothing to do with the storyline. It has nothing to do, it's, it's, not, it's not a trailer. It's not something that sums up the film. It can be something that has nothing to do with the meat of the film. But it may announce it may announce a certain mood, a certain color. Um, I always start the prologue thing uh, with a clip from Dwight Bean's film, Umbrella. <clears throat> I'll tell the story behind that because uh, Umbrella was a film that, like, uh, since then we've collaborated uh, on three or four other films together. But. Uh, 
Umbrella was a film that went in, uh, to competition in Venice in, in the Horizonte uh, section. And what happened was that um, he was editing the film practically to the day of the screening in Venice. So the version that he screened in Venice, nobody had seen. And that when, the, when, uh, when it was actually, uh, then it was actually screened, um, uh, Marco Miller and Marie-Pierre um, had me called up and said, oh, well, you need to recut this film because uh, you know, it's, it's, it just doesn't work structurally. And at that time, I had, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't, well, I had started to work with Chinese independent filmmakers and directors, and I had uh, some negative experiences, so I decided not to work anymore with, uh, with Chinese directors. So my, my only condition was that I would agree to do that, but he could not come into the editing room. And uh, so, so one day that you know they, 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 I was in Beijing in this room, and then this uh, this young man came in with a box of, because I asked for some more rushes. It was this box that it was still cassettes, cassettes, and he said to me, "Oh, you're scared that I would I would stay here, right?" I said, "Yes, you're not allowed here. <laughs> Just go away." <laughs> And, um, uh, but in fact, I already had an idea that I had something that I wanted to try and I wanted to show him afterwards. And I was afraid that he would reject it. So the story uh, is about, I don't know whether you've seen it, San. Uh, it's about the five classes in, in Chinese society, uh, industry, education, military, commerce, and um, agriculture. Uh, and basically, the idea is that the agriculture comes at the very end. The film was very long, it was two hours. Uh, agriculture comes at the very end. Basically, the idea is that in China, the, the, the rural, the, the agricultural community uh, is, um, can't live by the land anymore. So they have to find some other means of survival. Land is this land people uh, are just uh, not sustainable. So, um, so by the time you get to the land part, by the time you get to the agriculture part, it's two hours later, and the whole audience has fallen asleep. So <laughs> nobody knows, you know, like, and so what I wanted to do was to, um, before the beginning of the film, to give a hint of what, where we're going, like two hours later. Uh, and in fact, in, later on, the film was cut down to an hour and a half. So, so I chose, so I did um, a, a prologue for him, which he liked very much, and I hope that this is going to work.
The second one that I want to show you is, um, again, a documentary from Hong Kong. In fact, it's uh, uh, Xiao Bong Wong. Uh, it's called Fish Story. You might have seen it already. And um, it was actually during a Cinex workshop. And uh, the, the, the rough cut that he brought in was about um, two boys fighting with each other. Uh, in a, in a, um, I don't know how to say it in English, in a Tong Fong kind of situation. Like it, they, they, one of the boys lives in this tiny little room that is that has everything in it. Um, very poor kind of situation. And I thought that first of all we narrowed it down to. I, I thought that the central character is one boy, is not the two boys, because it got very confusing who are we talking, what kind of story we are telling. Um, so basically I narrowed it down to the one boy, and then, um, then I was trying to find a prologue. And in the middle of the film, there was one sequence, and quite often that I find that there are always miracles like this in, in terms of documentaries. You just have to be very patient to look at all the material, and there's always some part that there's nothing that was not used in the way that uh, later on that we use it. Um, it was, in the middle of a film, there was a um, competition, a school competition, and the, a poetry recital kind of competition. And this boy uh, won the competition by reciting a poem about planting seeds. And, and uh, Xiu Bo followed him to the competition, which is somewhere in Jim Sa Joy, beside the, 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 the harbor. And so he filmed the boy uh, talking about that, like, you know, reciting that in front of the harbor. And when I saw that in the middle of the film, I thought, well, this is our beginning. This is a, because it, this is exactly what they're talking about. Like you know, we talk, we want to talk about education, Hong Kong, and planting seeds in uh, little kids and um, and that kind of thing. Um, the other consideration was that I thought um, Tong Fong is something that is very typically Hong Kong, uh, and uh, and that it's a uh, it's. Um, Terrible situation in a, in a city that outside because I'm one of the things that I'm always looking uh, again from the outside to uh, for example to a situation in Hong Kong where I was born, but I always also have the point of view of of a foreigner almost. So um, so. The thing is that uh, do we know that uh, we have this situation in Hong Kong? If I was just coming from you know, uh, Toronto or something. Um, and how do you situate this in, in uh, and the contrast of having something that we used to think of as Hong Kong, very prosperous and all that. So, so that's why I decided to start the film this way.
奋斗到底的火热的心。This, uh, I, I still think that is like wonderful that the, the way that he recites that poem. It, it turns out like, you know, it's just a completely by coincidence that he was reciting a poem like that, which is exactly the theme of, uh, of the film. So I, I think that I've encountered this kind of situations many times, it's, it's this kind of coincidences. And I think, I always think of documentaries or the, the, the making of documentaries when, they, when it comes together is sort of very miraculous. There's always something that's very, that's a miracle that is falling. And um, so, and then the whole thing of going uh, from the city into, into his little place, uh, which was something that I really wanted to, to do. I don't know how many of you have seen that. It's a uh, 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 Bin Chun. It's um, filmed by Zhang Choi San, uh, Jesse Zhang, and it was. Uh, and so I'll talk about how that. That is very. The structure of that is very very complex, because um, she made Zhang Choi San made a fiction film some years ago called Big Blue Lake, and it was about her native village in Saigon, and where she was born and where she still lives. And in that fiction film, that story film, the very last scene has um, a village festival uh, in it that happens once every 10 years. And so she shot a lot of footage during that village festivals. In, in fact, people, that village, the people have gone out, to, emigrated out to Canada to, to to England, France, and so on, that, uh, and, and, and everybody comes back, it's the United Nations in this little village during that time of the Qingzhou. And when I saw the footage, now again, as a foreigner or as a European from Hong Kong, uh, I was looking at the footage uh, of the, for example, the family who had immigrated to France uh, or to England. And what I was afraid of is that um, this, this is um, a rather cliched story of the, something that we see on reports quite often on French television in late night news or something. You know, they run a little story about the, you know, especially at Chinese New Year time, about a Chinese family going to the supermarket or something like that. So for me, that's not where the main interest of her story is. And when I looked at the footage of the grandma, the, the mother uh, uh, who, who was left behind in the village, she was the really interesting one. She was you know, going around singing sango and all that. She was like, a, she had raised these six children uh, single-handedly. And so she was a really interesting character. And so the way that we worked was that Jessie gave me this whole mass of material um, I asked her to make a, an assembly or some sort of assembly with uh, somebody else with notes, and um, and that was with the accent of the the children who had gone to Europe, and using that skeleton, it helped me to see what I behind the scenes, you know, the the, the negative space that I wanted to use, and um, and then. 
you know, we decided to use the grandmother as the central character, and at that time she actually then supplemented more interviews or more talk conversation with the grandmother. Um, and also that she wanted it to be a, some sort of a, more of an artistic a documentary, so she had all kinds of different, different formats of material, like Super 8 or motion graphics and so on. So it was very exciting to be doing uh, like an artist documentary kind of thing. So that's, again, is that kind of working, is that she entrusted me with all these different, different, different kinds of material. And it was like a tapestry that I would start to put together. So it, it really involves a lot of trust between um, the director and myself. So, and th then, and of course, you know, I wanted to make a prologue. So um, this is the prologue for Flowing Stories.
Ta 十二月八至九洞楼长安朱古力、蘇格蘭格仔群、格仔銀包、英國好大包的沃克薯片、仲有牛油餅同埋好大支歐洲買回來的鉛筆。approach the prologue because obviously you have a lot of hours of footage are you um, I guess in terms of technique are you using uh, paper and computer to kind of sketch out the different like post-its or everything is on the 
Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because like the, I'm actually right now I'm editing. Um, I've just finished the first draft of this again. Huge, uh, a lot of footage. I mean, and uh, I think that um, it's really instinct, uh, instinct, in intuitive. I mean, it's like uh, it's something that. Um, uh, for example, the do I being one, I knew that I wanted some rural, some some sort of farm images, uh, and that's all. And I wanted some several four or five fixed shots, something very much in the do I being style, but very much in the countryside. And when we found the one with the with the slogan, it was even better, but because it, it's a do I being theme, and. Um, uh, and that's it. And then the, with those few shots, I lined them together, and then we changed the lengths and the thing, and that's it. Uh, with the fish story, just like I said, it just came about because I saw this this uh, poem that the little kid was reciting in the middle of the film, and knew that it had to go in the beginning. Um, and I knew that I wanted to have the city going into the going all the way until. Uh, uh, to his room. For this, actually, um, again, this is also the same story because uh, I wanted to. Uh, it was uh, I, I suggested to um, Jesse, again, in as a point of view of a almost foreigner in Hong Kong. Um, I, as a foreigner, I wouldn't have known that there's there are rural villages in, in Hong Kong that people live in. Um, so I thought, well, how are we going to tell this? Uh, I, I think that it would be nice to have the, the story told from the most cliche view of Hong Kong from the peak, you know, the, the, of all the tall buildings and stuff. And then you gradually go, 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 go into, into the village. And you situate where it is going. And we tried to do... We, we thought about doing it with um, animation or with, uh, with um, yeah, animation. Uh, it, it, it didn't work out, so I just tried it with uh, dissolves and, and, and it works beautifully. Um, and then she gave me so much material in terms of the little bits of Super 8 and stuff that, that I just wanted to put them together in a sort of poetic way. And it's... It's very, very intuitive. It's, uh, yeah, the, <laughs> when, when it's, um, that's why I always say that uh, for me, editing, or uh, I shouldn't say editing, this is for me more like composing, composing something uh, when you put different elements together. And it's really like writing a film. It's like doing a painting and, um, yeah. I guess, you know, it seems kind of overwhelming to think about story when you have so much footage. Like, are you, are you looking at everything? Like, everything that's shot? No. No, no I know. I, I know that you know, people say, ah, really? <laughs> you know, she doesn't look at the 2,000 hours of footage. No. <laughs> um, the the uh, the director would already do a selection. I asked always the director to come or send me a selection, and um, and then and then from that selection they would go into a lot more selections because uh, from that selection, for example, uh, Lina Yang who came to do a film about um, an orphanage in Qingdao that she filmed for over twelve twelve years and many many. Uh, um, characters, I asked her to come with about 30 to 40 hours of rushes, and she came with like uh, five times that much, of course. But, um, but again, like, that, was, um, that was first deciding which characters should be in the film, as there were so many. And then when we, when we have narrowed it down to five or six, then I look at her selections 
uh, and then I would ask, that's what I do all the time, then I would ask the director or the assistant of the director to say, okay, now for this, uh, I would like to know whether you have more of this kind and that kind and stuff, and where I, where I can look, and I would just look for days and days and days of the surrounding rushes. So I wouldn't look at the 2,000 hours, no. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, and and then to answer the question about you know how do you find the story in terms of this masses of material, which is one thing that we have been doing in the workshop today, is that um, uh, quite often you first of all like sometimes you have to even select your main characters because you don't uh, to, like like flowing stories the main characters for Jesse in the beginning were not was not this old lady with the children. Um, and, and I really thought that this lady is the, is the trunk of the tree and that the, all the children were like branches. And, that, uh, and um, the, um, the, the other thing is that then, then once you did decide on the characters, once you really think out which is your, your, your important character, then you have to start pulling that thread and see whether um, you can tell a story there. And sometimes it's quite scary because, um, I mean, I think that everybody who, who's done documentaries can, can tell scary stories. For the last uh, Do I Being film, which is still the, a young patriot still in Seal Teal, it was very, very scary because he had been filming for five, six years. And, and since uh, even, even before he started filming, it already, we had already talked about the, he had, you know, like been very enthusiastic about this concept and, and stuff. We changed a lot since then. And he decided to, uh, he said one of the three parts of the story was about this young man whom he found in Pinyao waving a flag. And so he followed this boy around and, uh, and I was supposed to set up a French co-production. And for first year, I mean, I look at the rushes, <laughs> and like, yeah, well, what do you have there? There's no story. The second year, no story. Third year, no story. <laughs> you know, like, uh, when, you know, uh, meanwhile, he's like talking about all these other ideas that goes around it, interviewing people in the streets, interviewing French intellectuals. None of those can be, like, can really be a, be a film. And it was only, I think, that, after three and a half years, uh, when the young man went to university, he went up to the mountains with his, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the film, with, the, with his um, fellow classmates in this very, very remote village up in Sichuan, in, uh, where you have to walk up another two hours after the bus and the truck and the stuff, um, to teach little bare feet children uh, for the summer, when he came back with that footage, I said, oh, we have a film, <laughs> you know? and finally we have a film. This is the fourth year. That, uh, and so he, he might have been, you know, he might have been following the wrong guy all these four years, and then what do we do? <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, it's a, and, and that's what I mean by sometimes that it's always like a miracle. It's uh, somehow, I'm sure that there are horror stories, but uh, the somehow that you have to also trust the instinct maybe of the director. I mean, uh, probably do I mean didn't choose this guy for nothing. He probably had, you know, a sense that there's a story there, but you don't know how many years it would take before the story comes out. So, uh, yeah. I actually want to know more about how you, you as an editor uh, contribute to like working with the music. Um, and a few of the examples you showed, yeah, it seemed obvious that you were, you know, cutting to the beat. So maybe the yeah. music was already there. Um, yeah, so how are you involved with, like, uh, integrating the music, I guess? Well, uh, for example, in the following stories in Jesse Jones' film, uh, we were very lucky to have, like, she was very fortunate to be working with... Um, 
um, one of uh, Naomi Kawase's composer agreed to make her music. And so he sent us a guide track um, before I even started to, when I was already editing. So, um, and then he, I used, so his music for flowing stories really inspired me a lot for the composing of the image and the sound. So that was very, very um, instrumental. That was very, very essential in the, in the way that that film was put together with, with his music, really. Um, otherwise, we work with guide tracks. Uh, quite often, we try not to work with commercial guide tracks because once you get used to the commercial guide tracks, it's very, very difficult to get, get, get rid of that in your head. Um, and, but, uh, yeah, qu but quite often that comes back to, that's good, to, it comes back to something that I wanted to talk about. Um, it comes back to something that I like to point out, is that uh, when I'm working with a scene or something like that, I, I quite often I say that try to go with it, try to find the internal music of a scene. It's um, even, of a shot, of a shot, because um, when you have, when we talk about rhythm, we're not talking about music that you put on afterwards. We're talking about that even inside a shot, just start to look about what is going on in the frame, like you know, which uh, who is going. Then at this point, somebody is walking across the frame, and somebody is coming this way. Somebody is doing this and stuff. Um, I think every shot has an internal rhythm, and the scene has an internal rhythm. And I think that it's really by fixing, uh, by determining what is the internal rhythm that you, 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 editing is really all rhythm. So you really can do something with the scene. And I think that sometimes when we feel that the scene is not right, it's because, it's not that the contents are not right, but that the, 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 the rhythm is not right. Um, and a lot of the times that another thing that I insist on is that um, try to alternate your rhythm because um, I have had in, in fiction, mostly in fiction, some people would say that, um, oh, can we make a film that would go and to this these big festivals like Venice or something. You know, uh, there's somebody has uh, even said to me once, you know, just you have to just put in some very slow scenes in the middle and they will go to Venice. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, well, I think that you can put in some very slow scenes, but then I always say that to then put in a very, very quick, you know, like a montage or something, you know, very quick thing, then it would contrast. So we we're working with that today. I don't know who, whether he's there. Um, to have something uh, contrast, you know, just, just try to do contrast all the time. Like, you know, when you have a scene that is full of sound, a lot of uh, noise and stuff, just do a sharp cut, a clean cut. Don't mess around with fading out the sound and stuff, just do a clean cut. And the next scene is like almost no sound. Then uh, it's the most effective. Just do, always do something that is very um, sharp, clean and, and surprising. I mean, that surprises even yourself, kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of the times we, when we, especially when we start out, we just try to, you know, it, people like to do dissolves and, you know, dissolve the images and dissolve the sounds and stuff. Uh, there are ways to do dissolves, the sound dissolves, especially when you have two scenes together uh, that you're, like uh, in fact, we were also working on that today. The two scenes don't that don't cut together, but that they are different time and space. For example, one of the very uh, uh, then 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 somehow people, uh, especially when they don't know what to do, would put in a cutaway in the middle or a transition shot or something. I would say just put the two scenes together and do a sound. You know, fade out on the sound on one end 
and fade it up on the other and and um, and work on the sound I think that's uh, most and so sound and rhythm and music it's really one of the most um, important things in in editing and another trick that uh, but I, I I have never managed to find an example of this trick I talk about it every time is uh, is that uh, I always say that uh, when when I have two shots that, uh, when you have two shots that don't cut together, and people would say, oh, these two shots don't cut together. Just cut them together and put a sound on the cut, whether it's a dog barking, I love dogs barking, um, and I have a collection of birds, so <laughs> and especially crows. You just say, put a crow <laughs> there, and, and far away motorcycles. <laughs> that works very well too, um, and it would work every time. Mm <笑>我真不是我大姑娘真不回来带你了带你读书了哪来现在我决定了已经还是你是不是跟妈妈回来你把心看不可能在屋里带你哥说一句你们一直不是你说的哦啊你们回来屋里带你你说的不是你你说的
全是凭他自己的本事了，哎呀，不勉强现在Another, another thing that I like to do very much is um, if you have some, some sort of action. Instead, instead of waiting for the action to finish, just cut in the middle of it. Uh, especially to a contrasting scene, like a quiet scene or something like that which would be much more effective than, than if you let the... Because we're we are always doing things like in film school, we're told to you know, do the establishing shot and uh, all, all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then we're, we're told to do, uh, we're, we're trained to do, you know, people uh, walk into frame, we people walk out of frame and stuff. And, um, and actually, uh, I, I love doing, and in fact, most of the films that I edit, the person is already in the frame a little bit when, uh, when they, they hardly ever walk into a frame. Uh, and sometimes I let them out of frame, but, uh, but they, they pause quite often already a little bit, like on the side of the frame. Um, and you will find that it's much more dynamic. It just... It just uh, makes the, uh, the the transition. It just really uh, makes the the transition much more dynamic, and so that was really uh, the way that it was built. It was that um, was that I, I wanted to keep the fight going as long as possible, and there was a little bit more actually. The, the fight went on for a little bit more. And this is, again, this is maybe sometimes I, I get asked a lot the question between, uh, of the relationship between uh, director and editor. And I think a lot of times it's a matter of negotiation. It's, it's sometimes it's total trust, like Jesse and myself kind of thing. But um, sometimes it's a matter of negotiation. But, and sometimes it's like I quite often say that the, the editor is the director's psychoanalysis, a psychoanalyst, a psychotherapist, you know, because it's a lot of times it's what the director doesn't dare to say or that are suppressed, that he is relying on the, the editor to, to say it, to bring it out, and then, you know, well, I didn't say it, <laughs> the editor who put it in. Um, so, uh, yeah, but in the case of, um, that there's, there's a lot of self-censorship with, uh, with directors. And so it's some, in, in that case, sometimes it's a matter of negotiation as well. Because in this case, I was able to um, get Li Xing to agree to prolonging the fight and using the mic in the fight and so on. But there is a certain point I would have, I would have liked to prolong it even more because there are other things that happens after. But, uh, but that's as far as he could go. And we have to understand that uh, even if we act as a psychotherapist during the process of the film, Finally, it's the director, the filmmaker, who has to live with the film or his life. So, so I think there is a certain point beyond which that they can't go and that we have to respect, I think. Um, so that was that, that was the, uh, so, uh, so I, I would say not to hesitate to cut out an, any kind of, uh, anything that is, uh, too, too, too much. I mean, I, I think that comes from, that really comes from the fact that I come from drama. So, so in fact, I'm, 
cutting this like a, a fiction film, and and that I, I don't I don't think that you need to see them setting up the table, or cooking. Um, Do I realize that if we're doing commercial things, we, we usually in such a long scene or whatever we tend to throw in some music, like suspense, mood music, or whatever, to tack in the shot, that we don't allow such a long time uh, for the space to carry. Is it a documentary practice to make it real, that you don't throw in any no. music? No, I, I, I use music. Um, I use music, but I hate using a lot of music. Uh, in, in fiction and in documentaries. And, and uh, in documentaries especially, but even in fiction, Mm, I tend to uh, compose with sounds, like, you know, with natural sounds, and try to make something like crows, <laughs> and try to make something uh, more um, atmospheric. And, and in terms of music, I think that the less music we use, the better. Um, yeah. Uh, although that sometimes it's not what we wish for, uh, especially when, when it's not, well, sometimes it doesn't happen that way, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, yeah. Where do you think uh, an editor should, be, should become involved in a project? Um, it depends on what kind of editor. I'm, I'm involved, I asked to be involved before, it's even uh, before, at the very beginning, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I ask to be involved. I mean, I, I usually I'm involved in the beginning because I'm some most of the time good friends with the with the uh, with the people I'm working with, and that um, so when the when the story is happening, when the idea is is starting, we, I already I already know about it. So, so because sometimes I start also trying to raise funds and stuff. And in one of the clip, you show us. Uh, of the Ho Xuan Bin Chun. Hi. I noticed that there's a change of um, um, a person's narration, like from the third person's narration to a first person's narration. I wonder uh, what's the f what are the factors that uh, affect you to change, um, to use different kinds of uh, person's narration, and uh, what kinds of things that we should be, be careful of uh, once we apply this kind of technique, uh, in fact, that that narration is herself. It's the, it's the director, and it wasn't a third person narration. It was really a first person narration. She said, she said, uh, 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 Grandma Lao. She used to live uh, next door to us, and that when whenever my mom, my, my and whenever they went to Europe, they would bring back. So it was the only narration in that film was was her, and it's a first person narration talking about her neighbors, talking about this family that we 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 are describing, and most of the time I I I, I try to um, I I try to ask the directors to be very careful about first person narrations because. Uh, it's very difficult for it to work well. But in this case, it works well because I also <clears throat> wanted to use images of her, of Jessie, in the film. For example, that, that scene where, where the grandma had this basket, which is you know, the way that we staged artistically this kind of thing. And then this was like a, just an outtake of her playing around and putting it on Jessie's shoulders. And I, I thought that is such a precious scene because it says with the whole, also there's a, a whole theme of transmission from an uh, older lady to a younger woman. Yeah, and so, yeah. Um, hi. hi. Uh, have you ever encountered uh, situations where, or, or um, how should I say, where the director gives you a set of footages and you realize uh, it's Im impossible to do what he's intending? to do or what you want to do like basically i'm saying the hop he may be a, a a decent director but the cameraman didn't shoot anything that would be helpful to <laughs> that scene usually it's the director himself or herself shooting so um uh yeah i i have uh, i have uh, yeah used very dirty words several many many times in the editing room yes yeah cursing the the person who's uh, i think 
that is that is a, it's a funny thing that we were talking about that with Kirsten the other night. I was saying that quite often I would curse the, the, the camera person uh, because um, um, again, quite often it's a case of maybe financial reasons and that um, that um, maybe it's the director himself, herself, or whatever, uh, holding the camera, and sometimes it's a friend, you know, and um, and the general uh, the general problem is that whenever it's like that, like a, a real good camera person knows when to hold it and not panic when 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 his subject or her subject moves away but you know you have this or you know they they could use the move the camera but that you can you still have enough afterwards to 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 cut whereas uh, somebody who's like um panicky would <laughs> move there and like move there and move there and move there and uh, and um I, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of those. And um, there are tricks to that. There are tricks to that. You can replace them, like uh, like the, the last clip that I did with the with the young boy, then talking about his birth mother, and you just, the ways to do it in a sort of more experimental way, to, to, to use a different shot or whatever. And there are also ways to do it, to, to just uh, change the speed a little bit, uh, reframe. <laughs> Stuff like that, but sometimes you can't you can't do much. Sometimes you just have to, and and always I think that it's a it's a lot of times just think in terms of I think a lot of editors don't especially in documentaries they don't think in terms of a separation of image and sound. I mean each clip that I see I'm thinking of it as an image and a sound. So I may be using the sound completely differently. I see, thanks. Just wanted to say that most of the clips that I showed, that they are available on DVDs. So let's give Mary Stephen another round of applause. Um.